Welcome to the Masters of Engineering podcast. Cool products, the people who develop them, and how they do it. I'm your host, John Hirschstick. I'm the Chief Evangelist at PTC. I've spent my entire life building CAD and PDM software. But the best part of my job, I get to meet some of the most innovative thinkers and the coolest product developers on the planet. In this podcast, you get to meet them too. Now, my guest today is an old friend, a wonderful entrepreneur, Christina Perla. She is the co-founder and CEO of MakeLab, headquartered in New York City of all places, and supplying 3D printed parts to the product developers of the world. A former product developer herself, Christina, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited. Thanks for having me. I'm honored. Oh, I know it's going to be amazing because I think almost every one of our listeners is interested in 3D printing. They use it to make parts. They use it to make product designs. Let's start by, tell us about MakeLab. What are you doing? What's your mission? So we 3D print parts, prototypes, and production runs, if you will, for hardware companies. So companies with physical products, company sizes are big and small. We work with companies like Peloton, Estee Lauder, um, Quip, design agencies, um, a lot of local clients as well. But our mission is to really provide a level of access and service in the 3D printing world that hasn't really been given or done in the past. And so we really pride on ourse ourselves on really being available here when you need it, um, very personable so you know if, if something goes wrong, we're here. We take on a good amount of risk to enhance the client experience. And, you know, we also print parts. <laughs> and tell me, when you say take on a good amount of risk, what do you mean by risk? We tend to, you know, this is a business that can be very transactional. It's It could be as transactional as a Staples print and copy center or a FedEx Kinko's where, you know, you send a PDF, the fonts don't load correctly, they'll print it and send it to you anyway. You know, to make that analogy, those are the things we'll look out for. So if we see that something's not right or something's blatantly not right, We'll, we'll try our best to catch it. We always do manual feasibility checks before anything goes to print. And before we confirm any order, before we confirm any deadline, um, it's everything's already always checked by a human. So we have the ability to check those things. We know that product developers, engineers, industrial designers, we're moving on really fast timelines and we're one just one teeny part of it. But we do have the ability and the power to create a waterfall effect of delays. So we don't want to be doing that. And so we try to add value where we can um, mm -hmm. by by really, you know, understanding what a part is going to be used for, if it's aesthetic, if it's functional, if it's the right material match. We try to catch those things as much as possible to be more than just a printing service. I see. So like the way I think of it, hearing you, and I, I've always, and I've, um, I, I said in the intro, I have the honor of knowing you and watching your company Likewise. grow and everything. So I know a little more, but I always think of it as kind of like you're bringing like the relationship is, as if someone had their own 3D printing service in house. Like if I had a person and a fellow employee next to me, I'd know them, I'd get to talk to them. They'd say, hey, like you bring that feeling to to the world of, of a outsourced 3D printing service. Is that that's kind of a that's way. correct. Feel free to use that. If you yeah. Know. Yeah, but that's it. <laughs> we, as opposed to just, oh, I sent it to a website and who knows. Right. What's going on. We don't yeah. want to be faceless. We don't want to be nameless. We want to be that extension of those R and D and product development teams. I think that's the most value add for the end client. And for us, I mean, we're all engineers and industrial designers ourselves. So we also get a bit of personal joy out of being involved. And that's I, I love I love hearing that. So you're so maybe that's a great segue in my next question. So you were a product developer and engineer yourself. How did you get started? What's the origin story here? You were doing something else before MakeLab. What what inspired you to create MakeLab? I get this question so much, but you know what? It was a total accident. <laughs> this whole thing was an accident. Like it was all serendipity and happenstance. So um, when I graduated from Pratt, from ID, I had begun dating Manny, who is now my husband and also my co-founder of MakeLab. Um, It'll, it'll be around, I think it'll be 11 years in May for us. 
which is crazy. Years. Eleven years. Wait, for Make Lab or for for the for two Manny years? and I for Manny and I. Okay, for the two of you. But okay. anyway, well, congratulations on that. Thank you. So I worked at Converse a little bit in the accessories department. I it was it was quite enjoyable. I managed a little bit. I got to you know communicate with factories in China, get samples, do tech packs, like make some decisions. You know, I got to see the whole design process through and through. But there was something that was missing, and I wanted to get back to more innovative products, not just fashion. And so I、mm-hmm. ended up leaving Converse and working with an old professor of mine. Who has、um, a small wearable tech design firm called Interwoven here in Brooklyn? Worked there for about eight months, and you know, I thought smaller, smaller team, faster pace was what would really settle my hunger. But about six months in, I started getting that feeling of, you know, I want to do more. I want to try it out on my own. I want to do something.、Uh, this itch, the entrepreneurial itch, and mind you, I was like twenty three or twenty four at the time, but. At that time, I said, "If I don't try this now, I'm gonna regret it. I'm gonna wonder, and if if I fail, I think I'm still young enough where I can be, I can learn and be hireable." <laughs> so, I took all that into consideration and started、uh, freelancing and taking on design clients and projects. With that, I was 3D printing for the first time, and I was doing it quite often for our. For the clients, and eventually Manny and I kind of teamed up, and he joined in. So we'd present as a team. We created a company called Tangent Design Inc. It was very much like a freelance type of vibe, but、um, mm-hmm. you know, a we wanted to consultancy. Yeah,、right? can, very very yeah. small. But we eventually、yeah. wanted to build a design firm. However, a year into pursuing this and formulating the company. Uh, the 3D printing company that we were working with, the vendor, we became friends with him. He was great. Service was great.、Um, they were moving, and they asked us to take over the company. And so we had this gut、oh. feeling. Yeah, this was totally by accident.、Wow. I got a text message on a Sunday night. I ran over to Manny. I said, "We have to do this."、Um, some like my gut feeling is just super strong. We just have to do it. We have to figure it out and do it. So about three months later, we did it. And we thought that design consulting was going to live、um, together and coexist with 3D printing, and 3D printing was going to be the cash cow that kind of supported the growth of of the of the design business. Well, you know, to our surprise, about a year and a half in, we 3x the 3D printing,、um, which was called Make Lab. We rebranded, and turns out we really loved. The operations of this problem solving, using our design thinking、mm-hmm. to problem solve, running a business, scaling it,、um, the path towards scaling seemed a lot more stable as well. So there was a lot that drew us to 3D printing, and then we went full time on 3D printing on Make Lab. Oh, that is、um, that is really an interesting story. I can't remember if I had heard it before, but what an amazing story! So, so kind of randomly, but a lot of times randomness and opportunity play into creating some amazing ventures. And you were so positioned as a customer. I think that's probably why you're doing so well and growing. And you have, you know, I think your my guess is your resonance. Would you agree with that? That fact、yeah. that you were a customer, you went、oh, from、yeah. being a customer to being a vendor. There's so that's, many that's nuances.、Fantastic. In a client experience, and the more you know, some stuff is just, you know, I I don't I can't even call it out. I can't even verbalize it. But there are just certain things that I know and that Manny knows because we've both been the been the client、um, that we just、yeah. build in inherently. And so with that, I feel like that that was our unfair advantage. So you're you you're a product developer and an entrepreneur. And someone makes 3D printed parts right now. And product development teaches us all. Those of us who have been through a product development curriculum in college, even when back when I went to college, it was a long time ago. But the we were taught to listen to the customer needs, and and、um, and that's great. How do you、um, do? You feel that working with your current clients lets you stay fresh with customer needs, and do you do anything? Because it's a fast changing field, right? And so,、yeah. what do you do? Personally, or as a company, to stay current with the customers of today, which are going to be a little different than when you were a product developer. I like to attend the events. I mean, again, like my my background's in industrial design, so I I joined、um, the Women in Design IDSA chapter as like part of the planning committee, and so that's my way of staying close to it. I'm a co-organizer of New York Hardware, so I'm at every event every month, and you know, I hope I get to a point where I can, you know. 
I hope that as we grow the company, I can still do these things because it's a little bit of personal enjoyment. Like I come from this world. I'm not doing it every day, but these events give me a taste enough that, you know, where I can still feel connected. And it also keeps me fresh. And we also have a lot of client pickups. And so oftentimes if I'm in the office, if Manny's in the office, we just pick up on things. We, we create those avenues of open lines of communication with our clients so we can get that feedback. This is so great when you talk about that. It's so clearly different than the idea of like a, you know, lights out automated printing machine or something that just takes, you know, STL files or something. Um, back to your, your you, you mentioned your, um, your involvement in organizations. This is another thing I think is really impressive to me that your commitment to supporting the community, being part of the community, but supporting it, leading it and supporting women in STEM. Can you tell us more about your involvement with things like um, women in design and others? Yeah, I was a part of women in 3D printing for quite a, lo a long time, from 2018 to 2022, I believe, is it was my involvement. And I was a New York chapter ambassador, and then I got invited and elected to be part of the board, which was really cool. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. I grew up with, I'm an only child, and my mom, it was just me and my mom. So my mom was a single mom. I didn't know anything. I, I didn't I didn't have that same view as maybe other people. In my eyes, women women can do it all. You know, it was just it was just what I saw. My family was very much a matriarchal type of family. My grandma was was, you know, the one like, you know, making sure we got the right table at the restaurant and, you know, making sure the waiters didn't mess up. Like I saw all these power women in my life. And so I think for me, stepping into business and kind of maybe experiencing some of the opposite was very interesting to me. Um, I just, I, I didn't, I didn't necessarily look at being a woman as like a disability. And I don't know if it should be treated that way. And I, I'm not a fan of that narrative. However, I am a fan of supporting and giving opportunities to those who did have a different experience. I kind of see it as like I was privileged in a way that I grew up in such a matriarchal family that I don't have, you know, I, I just go full steam ahead unless I get stopped, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but not mm -hmm. everyone has that view. So I see it as like, if I don't have that view, then I'm, I can, I have the opportunity to kind of pave, you know, be a snow, a snowplow for other women. And um, that's great that you do that. The stats yeah. are very blatant. It's very interesting. Um, so I'd love to see more women in these in these fields in general, too. Yeah. Well, I think it, you know, and, and I I think yes, yeah, so, you know, I totally agree, and I think it's good for the world. It's not just it's not it's not like doing women a favor. It's more like yeah. we'll build better products. This is the thing about diversity to me, and is it's good business too. We'll build better products. It's it's our debt. It's our it's our obligation to the world as product developers to provide the best products we can. I think diversity makes better products. It certainly makes for creativity. You learn, in, again, in engineering school in a sense that diversity of background, diversity of thought makes for more creative solutions. And so Agreed. anyway, for it's so many about, reasons, you know, it's the right. It's all about empathy when you go into product design. If you're designing a product for a very specific user base, like, you know, we were we were taught in design school that you do multiple levels of, you know, observation, uh, interviews, yeah. questioning, just following people around in their day to day to find those nuanced moments and those nuanced problems that you could solve. And that's the start of many different products. And I think, you know, to your point, John, like having if you're designing products made for women, for kids or for teens or, you know, for different, um, different, different demographics that are different than the, than you, it's good to have those folks in the room as well, because they, they might pick up on things that you may not. It's bias. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. One of the key questions I ask you is, is you see all kinds of product developers every day, really all kinds of things. And I love that you're in the phases from prototyping, which would probably be what most people would think of with 3D printing, but all the way through production volume parts. So you're seeing all these people design all these different products. I'm curious if you have advice for the audience, like what are the top couple things that you see all the time that make you cringe is like, don't do this. And what are the things you think are, are you know, that, you'd wish more product developers did or any other way you'd want to structure. What advice do you have? 
based on what you see. I will say it's gotten so much better <laughs> from when we started until now. I think education about like manufacturing and, you know, design and engineering, engineering not being so siloed in the greater process of product development and manufacturing. I'm seeing things get better. There's an upwards trend and we love that. Um, yeah. I still think though that there's so much work that needs to be done in terms of like getting that thought process earlier in. Like I understand the need for staying in a brainstorming and research phase and, you know, getting the the form out and really focusing on the user. But I think designing for manufacturing and designing for additive manufacturing, being that it's a it's a tool that's used by, you mm -hmm. know, the majority of, of folks in this in this industry, that needs to be brought in earlier. If, if you come to us with a deadline, a super tight deadline, and you say, I need a thousand parts um, by next week, you know, we got to get printed now, and you don't leave us time for DFAM, the chances of everybody failing on this mission is high. And so it needs to be worked in sooner. There need to be, you know, designing for manufacturing is also a testing period. You need to run samples. You need to test things out. If you're doing mating parts, mm -hmm. if you're mating injection molding, urethane um, mixed with additive, you need to test the parts. The tolerances are different. The CAD file should be different. Uh -huh. There's so much there. Mm -hmm. I could go on and on and on. <laughs> well, I, I am interested though. I, I have to ask you when you say DFAM, that stands for DFAM, Design for Additive Manufacturing, right? Correct. And so what would be, what would be, so you just mentioned one thing is it sounds like dissimilar materials mating, you need to think carefully about tolerances. What are the other like top one, two, three problems in DFAM that you think our audience, you know, quick, quick guide to mistakes? The simplest that thing um, that, I'm, that I am seeing a better trend in is wall thickness and minimum detail size. Um, sometimes embossed um. and deep, like embossed and debossed details as well. It's like what, you know, sometimes in CAD, you zoom in so much. I've done this myself. You zoom in so yeah. much, you think a half a millimeter is huge, but actually yeah. it's a very, that's not going to, that's not going to show up or there's a very high likelihood that wouldn't show up. And so factoring these things in. Um, so detail size, so wall thickness, checking that walls, when you say wall thickness, you mean a minimum wall thickness? Yeah. We go, we, we try to say one millimeter across the board, anything below that, it gets finicky. <laughs> in a lot of different materials. So minimum wall size, at least a millimeter, and watch that that you don't put in unrealistically small details. Great advice. What are what are good things that you see your best people doing that you'd like others to emulate? You know, like, like are there and it doesn't have to be about the geometry of the part. It could be about design process. It could be about being creative. I actually love it when our clients have their own printers at home. And I know many service bureaus would quite say the opposite. But I think, you know, if you're not near the tools, you're not running parts through a slicer just to test it and see where supports would land, um, you know, how and, and, and you don't know how big of a challenge that could be based on your part in the geometry, then you're not allowing enough time. Then it's, then it's making a bigger risk for everybody involved. And, you know, as a service, we could only do so much if we're only giving one day of testing, but, you know, the print is actually a day and a half long. Like <laughs> math, yeah. the math is not math, <laughs> you know, That's for example. Funny. So, yeah. you know, we, we've seen things like that before. And so I actually love it when clients have their own printers because they have some level of knowledge and they can specify print orientation and they have realistic expectations about what can and cannot be done. I love those. Uh, like That is great. That is great advice. So what you're saying is this is from someone who you make your living printing parts yeah. for people who can't do it on their own machines or don't want to. And you're saying you like it when they have a machine. That's that's actually really non-intuitive and really great advice. And what type of machine would be, how would you guide them to selecting a machine? What would be for their home or office use? I, so I'll talk about the considerations I'd make. I would make. Yeah. I would think about price. I would think about post-processing and the amount of tools you need yeah. for after the printer. And so for those reasons, I wouldn't always suggest an SLA printer just because mm -hmm. you need to cure it. Resin is sticky. It gets everywhere. When it breaks down and you need to repair it, it can get, it can get very complex and you need a bath of alcohol at all times. That's like pretty clean. So all those things make it hard to maintain. However, 
if it's an at-home printer, you know, small home office or small business, um, FGM can be great. I love, there are a few different brands. Some are on the cheaper side. You know, you can expect more maintenance there. You can expect more hands-off support from the, from the company there. There are others that are a little bit more plug and play. I highly recommend it. Even if FDM is not what you would use in the end, it at least gets your brain thinking about what is possible. And it gets your brain thinking about constraints, like design constraints, tolerances, fit, um, all the things that multi-part assemblies really need. Can you tell us what is your universe of parts that you print, however you define it, size, material, quantity? We've really gotten some good footing in the parts and prototypes world. So quantities under 50 is something I would say mm -hmm. we've mastered. We understand the processes. We understand the risks. We understand the materials, the use cases, the clients. Um, we're now entering more high volume. So now we're talking thousands of parts in in a similar short term term yeah. turn around. I'd love wow. to get to ten, tens of thousands, but you know, we got to one step at a time, as they say. When you say short turnaround, can you elaborate on that? What would be a turnaround time for one of your thousands of parts customers? We're currently doing that in a week and a half, thousands of parts. A week and a half. That is very, I, I think that's very good. One part, like what's the shortest turnaround time? For Next parts day. and prototyping, yeah. our lead times are one to seven business days. And so most so you, people- so you, yeah. Yeah. Most people turn around in three. They choose the three day lead time. Three days. So three day is kind of normal, but one day is possible and seven okay. days for a thousand or something. It's pretty amazing. And then can I ask you, what about like the range of parts size and material, color? Yeah. What what kinds of parts would you make now at Make Lab or in the near future? Color is more irrelevant because we're doing a lot of form yeah. testing. And so gray, white, you know. Honestly, we, okay. we've seen it all. Gray, white. It's very rare that I, I don't know if our clients are the ones that expect appearance cosmetic prototypes out of just 3D printed parts. Like they kind of okay. understand you need to you need a level of finishing um, after the fact. So white, gray, black, clear, even those are the norms. Um, we're seeing a range of size. You get some parts that are really tiny because they might be parts of parts. Sometimes it's, we're printing mm -hmm. custom hardware um, just for the sake of, you know, they don't have to go and buy it. They're printing anyway, just throw that model in. So we've printed parts as small as like five to 10 millimeters in the past. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, like we can get, like yeah. those, those are usually resin prints because resin can get that level of detail. We've printed- Resin SLA, meaning to SLA. tie back to your earlier discussion. So resin yeah. SLA printing, Small part, that is an advantage. So a customer, by the way, back to which machine to buy for your office. Yes. If your business is tiny things, the SLA then, printer yeah, is, is going to be. Sure. Okay. But so, so the small end, five millimeter, 10 millimeter, and at the large end, like. I'm trying to think about the bell curve of our large parts. Yeah. We've done I'm as big as, like, you know, a bust, yeah. a human sized bust. We've done okay. like, you know, window okay. displays for fashion, high, high value fashion brands. But I would say a normally extra large part, like, you know, the most common is probably around uh, 13 to 15 inches in one dimension. Okay. That's yeah. usually because yeah. we work in the world of consumer products. What about the range of materials used? We, and which ones do you avoid? And say mm, never. <laughs> but, yeah. There's use cases for each because like one-offs, I would print in almost everything, multiple quantities because of the risk factor and failure rates. and. Mm. The, some materials just have higher failure rates in general because because it is the way it is. But my we print in PLA, PETG, ASA, so that covers your FDM um, between visual and functional, semi-functional. Um, we're doing a big batch order in ASA right now, actually. What is ASA though? It's chemical and UV resistant, and so it makes gr for great like solid, sturdy parts. Um, that might be exposed to UV or, or other chemicals. Then yeah, on the resin side, we print a lot of standard resin, black, white, gray, and clear. So a lot of aesthetic models, we do a lot of beauty bottle packaging. Um, so that mm. all goes on the resin printers because they want the fine details. We also offer a lot of the form labs like engineering resins, like most of them, I would say. 
So hmm. you have like your tough and durable things that simulate polypropylene, ABS, um, maybe things that are great for springs, some of the flexible materials, the elastics. Hmm. So we do offer a lot of those. Um, yeah. But on the powder side, we offer PA11, 12, the um, glass filled nylon, and also the TPE material, all with MJF printing. And so what's great about powder is there's no supports. And so they make for really solid parts that you could, that have a lot of geometric freedom. And then lastly is the ink bit materials. And so we offer two, oh, we offer two right now. And I must say the yeah. level of precision that you get from these materials is just so fantastic. It's CNC level tolerances. And so you can do a lot of like fine prototyping and they offer a soft elastic. That's been a huge hit with, with our client base. What are you excited about in the future of 3d printing? I, I'm so excited for more ready, like end use ready materials. Like we've proven ourselves in parts and prototyping. Um, we have not in, in the greater manufacturing total addressable market. And that's just because reliability, um, you know, on the same machine, same part, reliability of getting that same consistency and same quality is still not there. Um, and the materials, it's hard to find and use materials that would work. There's always a caveat, even with metals. Um, with metals, you have to think about porosity. You know, I also wanted to turn to another area you're an expert in. You know, it's neat. You're a product developer. You run the printing service, but you're also an entrepreneur building a business. Yeah. I know you're a very thoughtful entrepreneur. You're always trying to do the right thing, thinking about your team and how to Thank grow you. the business thoughtfully. Sales and marketing. New website, by the way, at Mink Lab, which is really cool. Thank what you. What advice Thank you. do you... Oh, you're welcome. Well, it's true. You've <laughs> earned it. You know, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs in the product development world? Our listeners are thinking, hey, maybe I should start a company. Any quick advice? You got to have grit. One thing I've learned is whenever you feel like you're hitting a wall, it's it's a lot about perspective. You're seeing the wall, but you're you're not seeing that the wall is only 10 feet wide. You you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of moments I've experienced in this six or seven year journey of mine where I'm like, I felt very stuck. I like reacted as if I was forever stuck. But in fact, I found the the workaround. I got creative, thought outside of the box, asked for help, you know, all the classic things, um, you know, convinced myself delusionally that there was another solution <laughs> and then found it and then became better for it. And so I think there's a lot of just like, there's a lot of moments where you want to give up all the time in this journey of entrepreneurship. But like, John, I'm sure you've probably experienced this too. You just, you just, it's about your commitment to it. It's like, there's usually always a way there, there, I, I refuse to believe otherwise. And that might be a little, you know, I'm a little optimistic, but I do always think that, you know, there's a way, there's a solution for something, even if it's not what you initially thought. And it's just a matter of, are you willing to, to see that and recognize it or look for it? I actually think that's fantastic advice. You're kind of about perspective. I think when you say that, it's like, oh yeah, that's a great way to put it. Because sometimes, like you, you know, sometimes I think in a design or an entrepreneurship situation, you'll you'll see your whole world becomes this problem, and you got to kind of I think you're right. You got to zoom out and see a bigger picture, a longer horizon, and yeah. uh, that gives you gives you more space. I think it's fantastic advice. Um, I'm going to squeeze in one last question. <laughs> it's okay. Is is um, sustainability? Um, uh, wh what, if anything, uh, are you doing or the 3D printing industry uh, to make it more sustainable or, or, or improve the sustainability of the products people are making? I think I'm seeing a few different things and they're all small. They're all relatively small, but the, the small things make up a big thing eventually, right? Small pieces of the pie. So one is I'm seeing a lot more usage of cardboard spools for filament, which is huge. Mm. Plastic spools, <laughs> huge yeah. amount of waste, especially if you think about a business oh. like ours. So that's oh, one. Yeah. We got rid of um, plastic packaging. I mean, we use plastic bags to contain the part, you know, for humidity and, you know, just protecting it. But we use mm -hmm. paper packaging for everything else, um, including tape. Oh. We encourage in in many ways, local pickup. And I think we have a client base that also prefers that because they like to, you know, peek behind the curtain and see what we're about, you know. So we encourage local pickup a lot, which reduces packaging in general, reduces carbon footprint with shipping, and we also local local courier. And so shipping is probably the least favorable option for our business. It only makes up, I think, 40% 
of um, all of our dispatch methods of all of our orders. So most is local. I think your point about packaging and and even the spools, and I'm guessing that there's people in the audience who look at your own operation and what kinds of consumables. And I know people, a lot of people have done a lot of this already, but the focus tends to be on on energy consumption or on on the material use in the end user product, which would often be so important. But you raised, you know, even the tape you're using going to paper, great thinking. Um, and um, uh, I just want to say, I could talk to you all day. Thank Likewise. you so much, Christina. It's, it's really been a pleasure. Um, Christina, tell us your URL. How do people check out Make Lab for their own 3D printing needs, which I would encourage. Thank you, John. Uh, the URL is makelab.com. It's M-A-K-E-L-A-B.com. I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn. And so if you just search my name, Christina Perla, on LinkedIn and click the one with the yellow with the yellow uh, background, well, currently, uh, this year, unless I update my photo, <laughs> the one with the yellow background is me. And I, I'd like to respond to all of my messages. So it, it, it oh, eats at me fantastic. if I don't. Yeah. Yeah, so people should reach out to Christina. Well, you should get your parts printed or get DFAM advice, right? Yes. Or entrepreneurial advice. And um, uh, I really, I, I really love not only the parts you're making, but how you're doing it and the tone and energy around your business and Make Lab. It's fantastic. Um, to our audience, thank you all for your attention for watching. Um, Christina, thanks. One last thank you. Big thank you to Christina. Um, and to our audience, that's it for today. We'll see you next episode on Masters of Engineering.